Let's pray. Father, in regards to the ministry of the gospel, the ministry of reconciling men to God, the ministry of being ambassadors for Christ, your servant Paul assessed it very accurately, I believe, when he said, who is sufficient for such things? Who is sufficient to call dead men to live? But God, we also know that you have placed this treasure in earthen vessels so that the exceeding glory and power would belong to God and God alone. So Father, as we consider the gospel message this morning, Father, as you empower me to give it this morning, God, may the exceeding greatness of the glory and power belong to you and you alone. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, October 31st is a important day in America, in our culture, very significant, very notable, but not for the same reasons. Some people, this day is important because it is a day in which the occult and paganism and expressions of death can be openly celebrated. This is pretty obvious, I think, to most of us who live in America. For others, it is an incredibly important day because historically, the church chose this day and tomorrow, November 1st, to be a time in which redemption is openly celebrated. And unfortunately, this is not as obvious in America. The historical position of the church regarding this date, October 31st and November 1st tomorrow, is that it was set apart as a holy day, marking the fact that God has indeed sent His Son, Jesus Christ, to redeem sinners from their sin and to give those sinners a new nature the nature of holiness. From this biblical concept, redeemed sinners who have been bought back from judgment and wrath are now referred to in Scripture as saints, which just simply means holy ones. And we're not trying to associate with the Roman Catholic definition of saints. We're going with the biblical definition of saints, which just simply means a person who is Holy, made holy by Christ. So therefore, in this sense, from God's perspective, anyone who is an authentic, born-again, confessing Christian is therefore a saint. Even though in many ways we very humbly recognize that we're all a work in progress, right? So as a result of this biblical principle, the church adopted as the name of this special day of celebration, All Hallows Day. And the word hallows is an old English word, which we really don't use anymore, but it's just simply a word that has evolved into our more common word, which is holy. We see it used in the Lord's Prayer when Jesus taught us the formula of prayer, saying this in Matthew 6, 9, Pray then in this way, our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Holy be your name. And we see that word being used in All Hallows Day. So, taking some of those threads and tying them together, we see the result of what has come to be known in popular American culture with the name of Halloween, which is just simply short for all Hallows Day Eve, or All Saints Day Eve, and to say it again, so I'm not mistaken, the church's purpose, the church's intention behind this day is for it to serve as a formal day of celebration, 
a celebration specifically of redemption in Christ, whereby sinners have been made into saints. But unfortunately, as All Saints Day and All Saints Day Eve specifically has been in large part hijacked by our post-Christian culture and has become a day instead in which expressions of death, paganism, and the occult are openly celebrated, many, if not most Christians, have just absolutely lost the church's original intent behind this day. And it's very sad. But moving on, All Saints Day or All Saints Day Eve is not the focus of our sermon today, but rather instead the main point or the main focus of what I am going to get to today is the second reason why today's date carries significance for the church. As All Saints Day Eve originally intended to mark the celebration of redemption, it also turned out to be a very important date marking the redemption of gospel truth. Travel with, travel back in time with me to the 1500s, if you would, and the civilized portions of Europe in the 1400s, 1500s, there was basically one expression of God's church, which was known as the Roman Catholic Church. Its leadership structure was dictated by an elected archbishop who was then given the title of Pope. While the Pope served with other archbishops and bishops, he was given ultimate authority over the church because it was believed that he was the very manifestation of the authority and the voice of Jesus Christ on earth. Therefore, as it can be imagined, this position carried incredible influence and power. One area in which the Pope exercised his power was in his authority to ultimately determine what was God's truth and what was not. It rested in the Pope. The other significant dynamic which marked this period of time was that the Bible wasn't easily accessible to the common people. It wasn't that there weren't any Bibles in those days. It was just simply that unless you were part of the clergy, the priesthood of the Roman Catholic Church, then you were just not allowed to own one. And even if you did by chance come across a Bible, it would have been written in the Latin language, which at that time was the language of academics and higher learning and universities and, of course, the church. This meant that even if the common people had access to a Bible they most likely wouldn't have been able to read it anyway. So therefore, with those two dynamics of the religious culture, first of all, an authoritative leader of the church who is believed to be the very voice of Jesus Christ, and also the removal of God's word from access to the common people so that the Pope, when he claimed to speak authoritatively, could not be challenged, this was a recipe for disaster. And extreme forms of corruption began to surface in the church. One of those expressions of corruption came in the form of something called an indulgence. An indulgence was a formal decree issued by the Pope to people who did certain good deeds, meritorious acts, which would shorten their time spent in purgatory. Purgatory, as the popes had taught, was a place where everyone went after their death in order to be purged from their sins before gaining access into heaven. For most people, this meant hundreds and hundreds of years spent in a spiritual state of being purged, which wasn't necessarily a pleasant thought. So, in the pope's great compassion, heavy sarcasm, he came up with a solution to the purging of purgatory in that he would grant a decree of indulgence for anyone who would perform a religious act in honor of the Catholic Church. 
This corruption was twisted even further in the early 1500s, the date that we're moving towards. When the Pope began selling those indulgences for profit. Now, instead of performing some religious act whereby the Pope would grant an indulgence and time off in purgatory, all one had to do was just drop some money into the church's bank account. The more money one gave, the more time off in purgatory one would receive. Now, if we pause for a moment and... uh, Let me clear some things. This entire system is unbiblical. The idea of Pope, the idea of purgatory, the idea of indulgences, also the very idea of buying salvation, all of it is unbiblical and false. But the problem in the 1500s was that nobody really knew any better. Because scripture, the very means by which we test all things, had become hidden and even in a certain sense made obsolete. Except, that is, to those within the church, the clergy, the priests, including the monks. And here is where the date of October 31st becomes significant as we see God's faithfulness and mercy and preservation of the church on full display, right? Jesus said, I will build my church. And he has shown it and proven it many times. Here's one more example. We find that in the small rural German town of Wittenberg, Germany, there was a small university And in this small university, there was a small, insignificant Roman Catholic monk who was a professor of theology. And this small, insignificant professor of theology noticed something wrong with the idea of indulgences. It was as if he saw a thread sticking out of a woven tapestry of the church's narrative concerning salvation. And upon seeing the thread, he decided to pull it a little bit. And much to his surprise, as he pulled on it, the entire tapestry of what the Pope was selling regarding salvation unraveled and fell apart. This small, insignificant, unknown monk serving the church as a professor in a small rural town in Germany ended up changing the path of not only the church, but also even in many ways the entire world that we enjoy today. And the name of this small, insignificant, unknown monk is Martin Luther. On October 31st, 1517, as Martin Luther had noticed something wrong with indulgences and the practice that the Pope had had, uh, put into place regarding salvation, Luther posted a document on the door of the local church building, which basically served as the modern-day equivalent of of Facebook, right? If you wanted to post a public invitation for something, then you nailed it onto the doors of the local church where it was most likely to be seen because everybody went to church back in those days. And so this document was a public invitation to his fellow professors at the college to engage with him in 95 points of debate regarding this practice of indulgences. This document has come to be famously known, you've probably heard of it, as the 95 Theses. Ironically, this formal academic debate never happened because nobody showed up. Either the scholars were too intimidated by the power of the Pope, or they didn't see any problem with indulgences being indoctrinated into the teaching of the Catholic Church, or they just simply didn't care. And we may never know why exactly nobody showed up. But what did take place is that some of the students at the college in Wittenberg saw the 95 Theses, translated them from Latin into the common language of the German people, published them with the newly invented printing press, and it spread like wildfire. As a result, long story short, what followed was this. First of all, the recovery of the scriptures for the common person. You have a Bible in your hands due in large part 
to the sacrifice and the ministry and the work of Martin Luther. Also, what followed was the unveiling of the false teaching and false authority of the Pope, which also uncovered the many spiritual abuses in the Roman Catholic Church. So once again, without Luther, we would probably be still sitting under that form of teaching and abuse today. And also it meant the formation of a refined and reformed church in Europe, which was fully established on the authority of Scripture alone. We believe the Pope can err. Scripture does not. So this season of reform is what we call today the Protestant Reformation, Protestant protest. We protest against the Pope and his bishops and his councils and his traditions. And we hold firm to Scripture, which teaches contrary to what the Catholic Church teaches. Protestant Reformation, in which God's truth was reclaimed, redeemed, and reestablished as being primary. And so what seems like a coincidence, though in the providence of God it most likely is not, this all began on the eve of All Saints Day, which historically the church recognized as the day of the celebration of redemption. Probably not a coincidence. So for many of you who know me, you probably also know that Martin Luther is one of my heroes of the faith. To be sure, Luther was just a man. He was fallible. He had serious flaws at times. He had serious weaknesses. And even at times made mistakes, as all human heroes do. For example, at times Luther was just absolutely vulgar in his attacks against the Pope and the Catholic Church. You read some of his writings where he's addressing the sins and the, and the weak character of the Pope, and it's just downright foul. It's like, oh, I can't even read this. And also, Luther taught you know, the practice of infant baptism, which in all honesty is very difficult to defend biblically, but he held to it very strongly. So there are points where I see weakness in Luther. But at the same time, his strengths and his character of faith far outshine where he is weak. So as we consider Luther, we also understand that the Lord used him in an amazing way to recover biblical truth for the church. And of those biblical truths which the Lord used, used him to recover was the doctrine regarding salvation, which is defined in Scripture as being God's act of justification by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, according to Scripture alone, to the glory of God alone. And so to this end, in the remaining time that we have left this morning, in honor of All Saints Day and Martin Luther and the anniversary of the Protestant Reformation, we will take a break from our our, uh, series through the Gospel of John and turn instead to the book of Romans to hopefully see what Luther saw regarding what God teaches and regarding justification. So we begin this morning with Romans chapter 1, verses 16 and 17 reading from the New American Standard Translation, says this, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek or the Gentile. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, but the righteous man shall live by faith. In these verses, Paul makes a thesis statement of sorts, right? A a summary statement, in a sense, which serves as the main declaration of everything that will follow in the rest of the book of Romans. 
So if you want a summary of the book of Romans, look to verses 16 and 17. This is his thesis statement. Everything that follows is, uh, is in, in support of that. So for starters, in these verses, we are told that in regard to the gospel of Jesus Christ, there is no reason to be ashamed of it, right? Though Paul has many enemies, right? Paul was the one who wrote Romans. And though he had many enemies... Jew and Gentile alike, and though they had accusations of all sorts about him and about his message, at the end of the day, as the dust settles, he makes this declaration that in the gospel, he has no cause to be ashamed, and neither should we. The reason for this is because, as he says here, within the gospel lies the very power of God to save whether those who are being saved are of Jewish national identity or whether those sinners are of Greek Gentile national identity, regardless of ethnic background or spiritual tradition, in the gospel lies the power of God to bring salvation to those who are lost. This is a great truth and may we never be ashamed of it. So furthermore, in this statement, Paul points out a great theological principle which sits at the very core of the gospel message. And he says that in it, the gospel message of the power of God to save, that in it, the righteousness of God has been revealed. And that from faith to faith, just as the Old Testament witnesses. But the righteous man shall live by faith. Now, I think all this is probably pretty straightforward, probably pretty easy to understand, probably something you have studied before, certainly something you've heard from this pulpit before. But in order to feel the full force of what Paul is saying and to have it impact our hearts and not just our minds, and this needs to be felt in that way because it's incredibly important, we must understand what comes next. The news that Paul is giving us here is just absolutely earth-shattering. This is the kind of news that if truly felt and received in the inner man will change your life forever. This is the kind of news that if taken seriously will cause us to literally experience the very power of God. It's the kind of news that will make a difference about the way you get up in the morning. Also in the way you lay your head on your pillow at night. It's the kind of news that will deliver you from a life of fear and translate you into a life of life and victory. It's the kind of news that will lead you down a path of pure transformation whereby Scripture says the old things pass away as the Lord makes all things new. It's right here. It begins here. So therefore, Paul isn't content to merely make a two-sentence statement and then drop it and walk on down the road. The weight of what he has just said in verses 16 and 17 is too majestic. It's too critically important. So therefore, for the next 15 and a half chapters, he unpackages the depth of what this statement means. Now, I would love to cover all 15 and a half chapters this morning. Why are you laughing, Byron? (laughs) But for us, I understand that's probably not practical. Many of you are tired from last night's event. So I'll spare you and we'll only cover the first three chapters of Romans today. And then we'll bring it to a close, whereby hopefully we will have a clear picture of the doctrine of justification. As scripture taught it, as Martin Luther uncovered it, and as hopefully we experience it firsthand as Christians. So, in the following verses of Romans 1, after verse 16 and 17, in contrast to what Paul has just stated... 
That in the gospel, the righteousness of God has been revealed. That in contrast to that, he goes on to explain and demonstrate a different expression of God's righteousness. Specifically, that God's righteousness is also revealed through his wrath against unrighteousness. Here's what Romans 1, 18 and 19 says. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness because that which is known about God is evident within them for God made it evident to them. So what we find first of all initially is that is, is that which can be known about God in a very general sense, not in specifics, but in a general sense, the Lord has created mankind in such a way in which that general knowledge of God is evident within each and every person. Specifically, the ability to sense the existence of a higher power who is morally good. That this has been placed within every human heart therefore at one level or another for some it's deeper and clearer but at one level or another every person has sufficient knowledge of the truth of God and a very general expectation of morality but as Paul points out here since mankind chose to suppress this truth in unrighteousness and in ungodliness, God has responded by demonstrating his righteousness through his wrath. And let me just point out that the righteousness of God must respond this way to the unrighteous suppression of truth Otherwise, his righteousness ceases to be righteous. It isn't as if God can merely ignore the challenges against his nature and look the other way because it doesn't matter. Truth and righteousness must be given the full stage of their identity as they point to God. And when they're not, it's a crime of monumental proportions in which it is absolutely right and just for God to respond with wrath. The suppression of righteousness demands justice. So in the following verses of Romans 1, this portrait continues to be painted as Paul says such things like this in Romans 1.21. He says, For even though they, mankind, knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations and their foolish heart was darkened, right? We opened it up this morning with Psalm 14, verse 1. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. My foolish speculation says, no, nope, God doesn't exist, even though God has made it evident within them that indeed he does. Or the next couple of verses, verse 22 and 23, Paul says, therefore, professing to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man and of birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures, right? So we get rid of God. There isn't no God. There must not be any God. Instead, we'll make man God and we'll make animals God. We'll make birds and cows and maybe even trees. We'll make, we'll make all them gods. But Paul says... What they claim in this to be wisdom is actually foolishness. And so to this, we also see God's response of righteous wrath. Verse 24 says, Therefore God gave them over to the lusts of their hearts, to impurity, so that their bodies would be dishonored among them. Fine, you want to serve and worship the creature rather than the creator? Says fine. God will give them over to the lusts of their heart and to the impurities thereof. Verse 26 and 27, he goes on another 
example of God's response of wrath. It says, for this reason, God gave them over, once again, to degrading passions. For their women exchanged the natural function for that which is unnatural. And in the same way also, the men abandoned the natural function of the woman and burned in their desire toward one another. Men with men committing indecent acts and therefore receiving in their own persons the due penalty of their error. And again in verse 28, And just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, God gave them over to a depraved mind to do those things which are not proper. So what we find in chapter 1 is that before Paul is able to explain further the righteousness of God revealed in the gospel of Jesus Christ, he first has to take us down the journey of depravity, pointing out the depravity and the utter sinfulness of mankind who suppresses the truth of God. And as pointed out, and I'll point it out again, this depravity experiences a different revelation of God's righteousness. Not the righteousness of the salvation of the gospel, but rather the righteousness of God's wrath. Next, in chapter 2, see that was, that was easy, we already got through chapter 1, right? Next, in chapter 2, Paul continues to paint this picture by showing the role which moral hypocrisy plays. Romans 2, 1 through 3, he says this, Therefore you have no excuse, every one of you who passes judgment, for in that which you judge another, you condemn yourself. For you who judge practice the same things, and we know that the judgment of God rightly falls upon those who practice such things. But do you suppose this, O man, when you pass judgment on those who practice such things and do the same yourself, that you will escape the judgment of God? So in another aspect of the suppression of the truth, Paul says God is also pouring out his wrath and judgment on moral hypocrisy. He goes after those who, in a sense, are passing moral judgment against those who are immoral, and rightly so. Yet the problem is that at the same time, they are just as guilty because they are breaking the exact same moral principles. On the one hand, they rightly accuse those who practice sin, but the problem is that they are practicing the very same sins they are condemning. The point here isn't that we aren't allowed to, to ever make moral judgments regarding other people's behaviors, but rather that we aren't allowed to be hypocrites about it. There's a difference. I mean, just consider the dynamics of a family and raising children if we were never able to make moral judgments in others, right? Because this is the argument that's out there, right? Don't judge me. You can't judge me. Jesus said, don't judge me. You can't judge people, right? And there's just, it's, anyway. So just consider the weakness of that argument in the dynamic of a family, right? Right? We're never able to make moral judgments in others. Imagine little Johnny is throwing a fit and breaking things and yelling and screaming and hitting his little sister just simply because he was asked to clean his room or go to bed. What are his parents supposed to do? Oh, well, the Bible says we're not supposed to judge. So I guess we'll just look the other way and let little Johnny do whatever he wants. No, that's ridiculous. You correct the behavior. You step in and you discipline. You give instruction. You give a little swat on the rear if it's necessary. And you judge that immoral outburst with righteousness and love and care. That is proper and that is right. But what Romans is referring to here is that when that moral judgment in others judging that moral behavior that we see in others, becomes hypocritical and becomes a double standard, right? So, so if mom and dad are 
actively throwing fits and yelling and screaming and breaking things and beating on their sisters, well, then they probably have no right to step in and try to correct little Johnny, right? But So what Romans is pointing out is that this kind of hypocrisy is also an expression of the suppression of the truth of God. It isn't that we don't judge. That's silliness. That's foolishness. Of course we judge. Of course we make moral judgments regarding behavior. But what Romans is saying, to avoid the hypocrisy in it all, and so, therefore, with it, just as with the suppression of the truth in chapter 1, the righteousness of God is again seen as being revealed against this kind of behavior, hypocritical moral judgment. His wrath is being poured out in righteousness against it, as he says here in Romans 2, 5 through 6. He says, but because of your stubbornness and unrepentant heart, you are, storing up for, you are storing up wrath for yourself in the day of wrath and revelation of what? The righteous judgment of God who will render to each person according to his deeds. And then in the last half of chapter 2, we find a third example is given, this time concerning the Jewish transgression of the law and their suppression of the truth of God says this in Romans 2.17, But if you bear the name Jew and rely upon the law and boast in God and know his will and approve the things that are essential, being instructed out of the law, and are confident that you yourself are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness, a corrector of the foolish, a teacher of the immature, having in the law the embodiment of knowledge and of the truth, you therefore who teach another... Do you not teach yourself? You who preach that one shall not steal, do you steal? You who say that one should not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? And again, you who abhor idols, do you rob temples? So in the same vein of moral hypocrisy, Paul takes it to another level and points out that for the Jewish people, those who have been given the righteous requirements of the law of Moses, a very high privilege indeed, that for them, their knowledge carries an even greater weight of responsibility. And when that responsibility fails, the hypocritical suppression of the righteousness of God demands an even greater sentence of wrath. Right? This is the same principle which James gives in his wise counsel to those who would like to be teachers someday. Remember the, uh, the verse in James 3.1? He says this, Let not many of you become teachers, my brethren, knowing that as such we will incur a stricter judgment. Right? It's a warning. Make sure your calling is sure. Is this truly what God is calling you to? Don't let many of you rush into the office of teacher in the church. Why? Because as such, you will incur a stricter judgment. Same thing Paul is teaching in chapter 2. There are many great responsibilities for the teacher of God's word. One, most notably, is this, that the things one must preach and teach out of this book is also the same things he must strive to live. It's a special kind of of hypocrisy, just as it is for the Jews, to have the knowledge of God's oracles, to teach the knowledge of God's oracles, and yet fail to teach them to yourself. I read this quote this last week from another one of the great reformers, John Calvin, you either hate him or love him, you know, you say the name Calvin, people either want to hug you or punch you in the nose. But John Calvin said this, and I think it's right. He said, if a preacher is not first preaching to himself, better that he falls on the steps of the pulpit and breaks his neck than preaches that sermon in hypocrisy. I think that's right. That's extreme, but that's right. You pray for your pastor, right? <laughs> this is not easy. I'm a sinner. This word is holy and right. 
And before I preach it to you, it's got to be hitting here first. So, Romans. This argument that Paul has been making from chapter 1 to chapter 2 finds its pinnacle, finds its summary really in a sense in chapter 3, whereby the Word of God paints with a very broad brush and places everybody on the canvas of condemnation. Up to this point, Romans has been showing through a, a series of specifics how certain people groups are guilty before the Lord for failing to pursue His righteousness and suppressing the truth of His existence as a result. But now in chapter 3, in case anyone still uh, might be tempted to think, well, I'm glad Paul didn't include me on that list. I'm glad he didn't call my name out. Well, you're about to be disappointed. <laughs> Romans 3.10 through 18 chops down any remaining tree out there, right? So here's what he says. Quoting from the Old Testament, he says, as it is written, there is none righteous, not even one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become useless. There is none who does good. There is not even one. Their throat is an open grave. With their tongues they keep deceiving. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their paths, and the path of peace they have not known. And there is no fear of God before their eyes. So Paul, in quoting from the Old Testament with a universal application to everyone, says there are none righteous, <laughs> not even one. There are none who understand the Lord. There are none who seek for God, at least in the way he requires. Right? There's a lot of cults out there who think that they're you know, pursuing God in the right way. God's the one who sets that standard, not the cults. Instead, Paul points out that all have turned aside from God, and have as a result become useless in their righteousness. None do good in the eyes of the Lord, no, not even one. And in fact, to prove it, Paul goes on to quote from the prophetic words of David in the Psalms. He says, their throat is an open grave, their tongues are deceiving, their lips conceal the poison of snakes. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. And on their path to shed blood, they leave a wake of destruction and misery. They have not known peace, nor is there any fear of the Lord in their eyes. And in case we have forgotten, Paul is speaking and applying this universally to all people everywhere of all time who are suppressing the truth of God in unrighteousness. And in case anyone may still try to argue against this, Paul does a masterful job here by just simply pointing to the evidence of our words. Right? He says, all are guilty, none are righteous, none do good. Okay, Paul, how can you know this? Right? I mean, that's a pretty bold statement. How do you know, Paul? Well, simple, he says. Look at the words you use. Your words, which are like poison. Our throats, which are like open graves. Our mouths that are quick to shed innocent blood. Which ultimately, if we follow that train of thought, the issue, the problem is not our mouths, but rather of our heart. As Jesus said in Matthew 12, 34, you brood of vipers, how can you, being evil, speak what is good? For the mouth speaks out of that which fills the heart. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Paul, how can you say all are guilty, none are righteous? Simply this, look at the words that humanity uses. 
We are all condemned. Now, in the assessment of Romans at this point, I feel that you, I trust that you can feel the pressure of all of this, I, I hope. I mean, if not, we can keep going, but. I know I feel the pressure of it all when I read these chapters, these verses. All are condemned, all are guilty. All have suppressed the truth of God in unrighteousness and ungodliness. All we have to do is really look to the words that come out of our mouth to prove it. Pretty simple. Paul's a genius, probably because of the Spirit, right? <laughs> but if you're feeling the pressure of it all this morning, I want you to know that you're not alone. In fact, it was in this vice-like pressure, if we're allowed to return to Martin Luther for a moment, this vice-like pressure which Luther himself felt squeezed into time after time. In his early days as a Roman Catholic monk, pre-95 Theses, but in these early days as a Roman Catholic monk, part of his routine was to regularly, often, systematically appear before the priest of the monastery in order to confess his sins. And for most of the monks, this ritual lasted minutes. For Luther, it lasted hours. He would confess and confess and confess. And then after spending hours before the priest confessing everything that he could call to mind that he had done that was sinful, he would leave, get a little ways down the hall, and then remember something that he had forgotten. And he would return again to the priest and begin confessing all over again. Luther was a man who was haunted by his depravity and sinfulness and unrighteousness before God. In fact, he became famous around the monastery for his acts of penance and confession, always seeking to find resolution, always seeking to find some kind of peace to his unrighteous standing before God. He knew it, but he just couldn't seem to work hard enough. One day, one of the local priests tried giving him some advice and told him, you know what, Luther, you're really making a big deal of all this. Why don't you just forget about all the nonsense about sin, reconciliation, righteousness, and just love God. Right? That's a message today you hear in the church. To which Luther famously responded, Love God. Love God. I hate God. He expects me to do what I cannot do. He has established a requirement of righteousness which I cannot attain. Love God? Luther said, I hate God. <laughs> Brutal honesty. But it accurately reflected the frustrations of his hopeless condition. I cannot work hard enough to attain and achieve the righteousness of God. And he lived there for years, trying to figure it out. Trying to work hard enough, trying to confess enough, trying to be holy enough. You know, and possibly, maybe, if we're just honest with ourselves in here today, maybe we've grown up in the church, maybe we know a lot about God, maybe we know a lot about this book, and boy, we're really trying hard. We're trying hard to achieve a righteousness that God will accept to where we'll feel justified before Him. I finally did enough good works. Now God will accept me. 
Maybe that's you today. Maybe that's you identifying with Luther. If so, let me give you some hope because that's, that's a dead-end road, my friends. In the story of Luther, it really quite honestly can't be told apart from the book of Romans. That's why I've chosen Romans this morning in one part. But and the reason is that if these scriptures hadn't providentially found their way into his hands and the Holy Spirit had, hadn't illuminated its truth for him, no doubt Martin Luther would have passed into history completely unknown and probably unsaved. But instead, an event bordering on the miraculous happened in which he was given access to a Bible, the very same Bible you have. And he was exposed to the book of Romans, just as you are being this morning. And the Spirit did quicken his mind and his heart to understand what was being read. And this changed everything. The earth-shattering, life-changing truth, which was uncovered for Luther, is found at the end of Romans chapter 3 and verses 21 through 26. It should be underlined in your Bible with a lot of exclamation points and stars around it. But let me read it for you carefully. It says this, Romans 3, 21 through 26. So after making his case about the unrighteousness of man, all of us, he goes on to say, but now... Apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested. Oh, that gets my attention. Being witnessed by the law and the prophets, the Old Testament, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, but being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation, right? Propitiation is the sacrifice appeasing the wrath of God in his blood through faith. This was to demonstrate God's righteousness because in the forbearance, patience of God, wisdom of God, he passed over the sins previously committed. For the demonstration, I say, of his righteousness at the present time. So that he would be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. And so after building a case against all of humanity everywhere, showing that before God, everyone is condemned, and the only righteousness of God which we can expect to see and experience is the righteousness of his wrath, and justly so. After all of that, we come to chapter 3, and Paul drops the bombshell of the gospel, showing clearly why he is not ashamed of it, and neither should we. In this passage, just briefly, Paul spells out this great, these great truths, saying that apart from the law, Another form of God's righteousness has been manifested, right? That should get our interest. This is testified to in the Old Testament writings of the law and prophets. Namely, that the righteousness of God revealed through faith in Jesus Christ. To be sure, there is no distinction that all have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. But God has given the gift of justification, by his grace, in the person of Jesus Christ, according to faith. And all of this by his work of propitiation and the shedding of his blood. All of this is a demonstration of God's righteousness, a different expression of his righteousness, whereby he is both the one who is just and justifier. He is the just judge. He has every right to pour out his wrath on unrighteousness. But at the same time, wonder of wonders, he also becomes the one who justifies Jesus Christ on the cross. The wrath of God poured out on him. 
you see, there's something we need to remember always, and it's this, is that sin is always punished. It isn't as if we sin and then we just get a passing mark and God looks the other way and forgets about it. Sin is always, always, always punished. So if it feels like we've been given a pass on this sin that I've just committed, well, in a sense you have, but that sin was still punished on the cross. Jesus took your punishment for you. He became the propitiation of God's wrath. And so, in an amazing statement, through Christ, God has expressed His righteousness by being both just and the justifier. For Luther, this changed everything. He writes in his own words that when I came across the great truth of Romans, it was as if the gates of paradise had been made fully open to me and I ran in. No longer was he a frustrated, angry monk trying to figure out how to please an even angrier God. No longer was he a depressed, penitent monk trying to gain forgiveness of sin by a human priest. No longer was he bound up in fear and misery, but now he was free and full of peace with God. Now he understood, as Scripture teaches, that salvation is not according to works, but rather according to faith in Jesus Christ. And in this truth, he found his justification before God. What the Catholic Church had covered up and tried to bury, Luther with Romans chapter 3, uncovered it for the whole world to see. So my friends, in conclusion, I've tried pretty hard this morning to demonstrate in this brief time together the very central core of the truth of the gospel. All right, what is the gospel? Well, I've tried to give you a a little bit of a taste of that. Hopefully, maybe you've seen more. I have tried to show its effect and also very briefly have shown it in the life of Martin Luther, whom the church, the modern church, has much to be thankful for. But honestly, my friends, I am at the end of what I can do. In all of these things, I realize that I am woefully insufficient to get this truth from your head to your heart. I am merely a clay pot pouring out the water of God's word. So now I leave you in the hands of the Holy Spirit this morning, praying that he is, I believe, already at work, bringing this truth of God's word home, teaching us, maybe afresh and anew, maybe for the first time ever, what the gift of God's justification looks, by, looks like, whereby the just shall live by faith in the Son of God who loved us and gave himself up for us, for this is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. And that will change your lives. Amen? Worship team, would you come? The rest of you, would you pray? Father, we thank you so much that you are indeed the God who has not only planted the church, but you are the one who continues to build it, to grow it, and in that, to preserve it. Father, that when devils may come, and try to water down your truth, or even remove your truth, God, we trust that you are more than sufficient, more than powerful enough to preserve the word of God so that people may find hope in Christ. God, we thank you for your servant, Martin Luther, who is a prime example of your work in preserving the church. 
Second of all, Father, we pray this morning that maybe for those who are hearing the gospel message for the first time or, or maybe for the thousandth time, but for some reason today it just clicked, God, I pray that your Holy Spirit would work in their lives, regenerating their hearts, regenerating their minds, bringing them to a place of being born again, whereby they will confess without shame, Jesus Christ is Lord. So Father, I just ask for you to work in this room, work in those at home who are listening, and all of this to your glory, in Jesus' name, as we trust in Christ alone. Amen.